Sets are collections of objects called elements. We should conceptualize the elements of a set as discrete loose grains of sand having no relationship to one another. Two elements x and y can either be equal or not equal, and that's the end of it. We can add mathematical structures to a set x to make it into something more. To give a set a sense of shape, we can introduce a concept of distance, so that elements aren't restricted to just being equal or not equal. They can be closer to one another or farther away. Specifically, for each pair of elements x and y in the set x, we define their distance to be some non-negative real number, which we denote by d of xy. This assignment of a distance to each pair of points mathematically constitutes a function whose inputs are pairs of points of x and whose outputs are non-negative real numbers. This function tells us how far each element of x is from each other one, thereby arranging the loose grains of the set x and serving as the epoxy that holds them together. The resulting object is called a metric space. In this context, we often call the elements of our set points. In this short video, we'll define metric spaces and give a few important examples we'll encounter during our study of real analysis. Formally, a metric space has two parts, the set x giving its points, and the metric d that gives the distances between pairs of them. When the metric is clear from context, we often omit it and just talk about a metric space x. But don't forget there's always some metric in play. This metric must satisfy three simple axioms. First, the distance from any point to itself must be zero. And this must be the only way a distance between two points can be zero. Second, order shouldn't matter. The distance from x to y must equal the distance from y to x. Third, the distance between two points can't be made smaller by a stop in the middle. The total distance going from x to y to z must be at least as large as the direct distance from x to z. This law is called the triangle inequality due to its connection to the fact that one side of a triangle can be no longer than the sum of the other two. All these axioms do is ensure that we can indeed treat the value d of x, y as representing the distance between x and y, and they allow us to formally justify our reasoning about these distances in proofs. Now let's see some examples of metric spaces. It can be checked that each one satisfies the three axioms above. Any set x can be given the discrete metric, which assigns any two distinct points a distance of 1. This extreme example of a metric space preserves the loose grains of sand aspect of the original set. None of these points are close to one another, and thus this metric space acts in some sense like a plain old set. It doesn't draw very well, but all of the points are one unit away from each other. So if you look at what's around any given point of a discrete space, you see all the other points exactly one unit away. And this is how it looks around every point in the space. The real line can be given a metric by defining the distance between two real numbers to be the absolute value of their difference. This is actually our model for metric spaces. We'll see later that our usual real number definitions for limit of a sequence, Cauchy sequences, and continuity of functions, when we state them in terms of absolute values of differences, lead us directly to the definitions we use in general metric spaces. If we have a metric space x with metric d, and a subset a of x, the metric on x lets us define a metric on the subset a as follows. Given two points of a, those points are also in x, and the metric on x assigns some distance to them. That same distance can be used in a. The net effect is that, discarding the original set x, our subset a acts as a metric space in its own right. We call a a subspace of x. For example, the real line forms a metric space as above. So every interval in the real line can be considered as a metric space. The same could be said for any subset of the real line. Finally, any normed linear space, and we've seen quite a few, can be viewed as a metric space if we define d of xy as the norm of x minus y. The three axioms for a norm line up quite nicely to prove that this function is indeed a metric. Thus, our little LP spaces, our space of continuous functions on an interval, etc., all can be viewed as metric spaces. These last examples are where we can really see the value of this abstract notion of metric spaces, and this is why we'll study metric spaces carefully. Consider sequences of real numbers, which we discussed at length in Chapter 1. Via metric spaces, we can apply much of what we defined, convergence, divergence, even Cauchy sequences, equally well to sequences of continuous functions, in C of AB using some norm, and even sequences of sequences in LP. The abstraction allows us to work with all of these in a consistent way, 
shielding us from worrying about what specific type of sequence we're looking at. We'll do exactly this in the next video. As a final teaser for later, let's think about integration. We know that integrating a continuous function on a closed interval AB results in some real number. In other words, integration is an operation that maps each function in C of AB to a real number. Both the domain and the codomain here are metric spaces, and it turns out that this operation of integration is continuous. Now, keeping consistent with Carruthers, let MD be a metric space. It bears repeating that everything we say about metric spaces applies to a wide range of contexts and analysis, from the real line to our spaces of functions and of sequences. Nevertheless, all the pictures we draw will be in the plane, where we can most easily draw and inspect them. Keep in mind that pictures don't count as proofs, but they can be very useful in helping us to see, conceptualize, and understand things about metric spaces, so we'll use them frequently. Take any point x in our metric space m. Our first three concepts concern the points of m nearby that point x. For any positive real number r, our first definition is that of the open ball of radius r about x, which contains all points in m whose distance from x is strictly less than r. We use a dotted curve in our diagram to indicate that this open ball contains all points up to, but not including, that boundary circle. We denote this open ball by b sub r of x, and the symbolic definition of this subset of m is a literal translation of what we just said. b r of x is a set consisting of all elements of m whose distance from x is strictly less than r. A slight variation in the definition and the figure give the closed ball of radius r about x, which is the same as the open ball but includes the boundary circle of points at distance exactly r from x. We use a solid curve in our diagram to indicate that the points in the boundary circle are now included. We denote this closed ball by b bar sub r of x. That is the same notation with a bar on the b, which you can think of as representing the boundary we now include. The only difference in the symbolic definition is that we use a less than or equal to sign to include the points at distance exactly r from x. Open and closed balls about x are examples of our third concept. A neighborhood of x is any subset of m that contains an open ball about x of some positive radius. An open ball of positive radius about x is the simplest type of neighborhood of x. It is an open ball. A closed ball of positive radius about x is also a neighborhood of x, because it contains an open ball about x. It also contains some other points, and this leads us to the full idea of a neighborhood. In general, a neighborhood of x consists of all the points in some open ball of positive radius around x. This is the important part. It may also include whatever other points of m that it likes. Our precise logical definition is that a neighborhood of x and m is a subset n of m for which there exists r greater than 0 such that br of x is contained in n, which expresses exactly what we first said. It's a subset of m that contains some open ball of positive radius about x. Now we'll discuss two other concepts relating to the size of a subset A of a metric space. First, to say that A is bounded means that it's contained in some open ball in M, having some finite radius. Symbolically, A is bounded means that there exists x in M and r greater than 0, these are the two parameters of an open ball, such that A is contained in B sub r of x. If you recall seeing the word bounded before for sequences, this is related. A sequence is bounded just when its set of terms is bounded, and this definition works for sequences in any metric space. Our second concept is that of diameter, which represents how far apart points in A can get. Specifically, we define the diameter of A by looking at the set of all possible distances between points in A and taking its supremum. To be clear, there need not be a pair of points in A that realizes this distance, but recalling what we know about the supremum, we can at least approach that distance via pairs of points in A. It's a quick exercise to show that a set A is bounded just when its diameter is finite, at least as long as the metric space M is not empty. Having a finite diameter is actually a more proper definition of being bounded, or equivalently, that this set of distances is bounded above in the real line. This also shows the fact that being bounded or not is a property intrinsic to the metric subspace A itself, having nothing to do with the containing metric space X. In our next video, we'll discuss sequences in metric spaces. Till then.